Now, in contrast to the primates, which is a perfectly good monophyletic unit, as are the ratites, there have been historically a number of mistakes where in trying to reconstruct evolutionary history, basing it on too few phonetic or phenotypic differences, mistakes were made. And so we're now going to look at a few examples of non-monophyletic taxa. First is a good example of a paraphyletic classification. This is one that's incomplete because it doesn't include all descendants. So as we've seen from that classification of the primates, the apes include the orangs, the gorillas, the chimps. There's a fourth great ape called bonobos. Again, we'll look at them later in the course. And there's another species here, us. Our closest relatives are the chimpanzees, and yet we're not included in the term pongidae traditionally. There has always been a distinction between the pongidae and the hominidae. Hominid, hominid, the hominids, you know, hom human type things. And so the term pongidae is not useful to an evolutionary biologist because it's incomplete, it's paraphyletic. Where's Waldo in that classification? He's missing. Now, that's partly because of resistance to including humans on the family tree of life, but there are other examples of paraphyletic classification that have arisen because of misunderstandings about whether a trait reflects common ancestry or not. And the reason we have to be careful is that you can see very similar traits in very distantly related organisms that share that trait not because of a common ancestry, but because of what's called convergent evolution. And a classic case of this is wings. So butterflies have wings, birds have wings, bats have wings, but these are due to the common problem of wanting to be able to move through the air. As we'll see later in the course, a butterfly's wings evolve from gill flaps on their back. Okay? Birds and bats both modified their forearms to become wings, but this is very, very separate. Bats are not related to birds at all. Okay? They have been mammals. They're descended from rodents who climbed up trees virtually, or tree shrews anyway, not rodents. And birds are descended from dinosaurs. So these evolved very separately. So these are not homologies. So this is another key term here, is analogy. These are analogous structures. They're similar, but they're similar because of convergent evolution, the need to solve the same problem. So birds and bats both have wings, but not because of common ancestry. Now, another classic example of this is in the case of being able to move quickly through the water. And we have here a shark at the top, a penguin in the middle, and a dolphin at the bottom. The top is a fish, the middle is a bird, the bottom is a mammal. They each evolved that streamlined shape, allowing them to move rapidly through the water, separately and independently. Penguins' ancestors lived on land for tens of millions of years, and they were shaped like ordinary little birds. It was only after they went back into the water that they developed that streamlined shape. Dolphins, as we'll see, are actually related to pigs. And so they evolved that shape, very similar in many ways to a shark, way after they had diverged. So it's not common ancestor that gives the common shape, it's convergent evolution. So these traits, again, are called analogies. During the times of Linnaeus and even in, well into the 19th and early 20th century, taxonomists had available to them only a, a limited number of physical characteristics that they could use for making their classifications. And so inevitably, they made mistakes. And if you're trying to classify things purely on physical similarities and use that phonetic system, it makes no, it doesn't surprise anyone to see that in the phonetic classifications, people would cluster lizards as being closely related to crocodiles and birds as being quite distant from those other two. But as I'm about to show you, it turns out that's wrong. In fact, birds are very closely related to crocodiles, neither of which are particularly closely related to lizards. The phylogenetic relationship, therefore, is quite different from one based solely on superficial physical similarities. So this is where we're going to encounter the word reptile 
which is a perfectly good term. If you've been on a bad date and the guy was a creep, he's a reptile, right? You can say that. That's fine. And we'll informally use the word reptile every now and then in the course, too. But as a formal unit of classification, the term reptile is incomplete because anything that includes lizards and crocodiles but doesn't include birds is wrong because birds are very closely related to the crocodiles. Birds, as I'll see here and show you again at numerous points in the class, are indeed directly descended from dinosaurs. So you no doubt have seen a Tyrannosaurus in the movies and at theme parks. They were on the, their hind legs. They had smallish forearms, but they walked around on their hind legs. And that mode of transportation we still see in birds today. It happened somewhere along here that birds developed feathers and then their forearms were modified to become wings. And so you have the evolution of powered flight. As we saw last time, there are some fossils that clearly show the existence of feathers and teeth in the same animal. These were dinosaurs, but they had feathers. Eventually, they became birds. And the, even the earliest birds were quite different from what we have now. There were flying dinosaurs that had feathers on their hind legs and use all four limbs in gliding around from one place to another. So nobody doubts that in that broad term that we all use, reptiles, dinosaurs were definitely reptiles, but birds descend from reptiles. And if we use the word reptile formally, strictly, as a taxonomist, we should be thinking, ah, oh, yeah, that means birds too. But traditionally, it did not. Traditionally, it excluded birds from that classification. Now, just to emphasize again the relationships between birds, there are other traits besides physical characteristics. And this is a wonderful example of fossilized behavior. This is an adult Psittacosaurus that, during a volcanic eruption with this hot volcanic ash falling everywhere, protected her young. So she had 34 babies, and she's all huddled over them, okay? This is a dinosaur. And she was very, very maternal, very protective of the offspring. Okay? This kind of behavior is also homology. It's similarity by common ancestry. The ancestors of the birds were dinosaurs. Dinosaurs were really careful parents. They looked after their babies, just like modern birds do. This behavior of protecting the nest we would see in any number of living birds today. And crocodiles, although superficially they may look a lot like lizards, Lizards are terrible parents. They lay their eggs and they just disappear. They have nothing else to do, them, do with them. But like birds, crocodiles build good nests, brood their eggs, protect their eggs, fuss over their eggs. If the eggs get dry, mother drizzles them with urine. When the hatchlings emerge, they cheep like chicks, which alerts the mother to uncover the nest and begin carrying the newborns to the water. The mother may stay with her young for a couple of years, protecting them from predators and shepherding them through hard times. Isn't she a great mom, right? That's very bird-like. Birds are very, very good parents, OK? This is not like lizards, OK? So this is another way that we can see that not only just looking at the fossil history and that there were fossil dinosaurs that clearly we see linkages to becoming birds, the behavior of the dinosaur is retained into the modern crocodilians and into the birds, those close relatives. So I want to use a cladistic approach here to show how we disregard evidence from analogous traits and focus on the homologous traits for making our classifications. So for this, we've got two mammals on the left. We have a shrew, we have a bat, we have birds, and we have crocodiles. Okay? The bat and the bird both have wings. Okay? Neither the shrew nor the crocodile do. Both of these have hair. Both of these have scales. So how are we going to use that information? Well, everything we know about the evolution of the vertebrates tells us that hair evolved just once. And so hair is a homologous structure in the mammals. Okay? Scales were the ancestral condition. And so scales are still retained 
by common ancestry both in the birds and the crocodiles. Birds have a few scales on their legs, on their feet, and around their eyes. Crocodiles, of course, are covered in scales. But hair evolved just the one time in the ancestor to all modern mammals, and so all modern mammals have hair by common ancestry. So those are both homologous structures, evolved once and retained by descendant species, all the way to the present in the case of birds and crocodiles, but then were replaced by hair in the mammals. Now let's turn to analogous structures. And we saw that both birds and bats had wings. What do we make of that? Well, wings evolved separately in the bats after the origins of the mammals. The mammals did not have wings in the beginning of that lineage. And then birds developed their wings after they had separated off from the crocodilians. So these are analogous traits. These are similarity by convergent evolution. So we look at birds, we look at bats, they're about the same size, they both have wings, but hey, who's your cousin? It's not the bat. The cousins are the crocodiles and the birds. So another way that things can go wrong has been when mistakenly people have used a term to describe a grouping of organisms that may have multiple common ancestors. And it turns out that the term panda is a polyphyletic term. Panda, in fact, to a lot of zoologists, are they really the same? I mean, there's a red panda down there, and I guess there's some similarities in the markings on the face, but wow, they've got a tail. Giant pandas, they don't have a tail. Are they really the same evolutionary unit? Do they belong in the same taxonomic classification? And one of the ways that we can check for this is to use DNA. And we're not quite at DNA. That'll be in another couple of lectures. But let me just give you a few key things. Is that our chromosomes, which carry the genes that code for all of our proteins that comprise our bodies, are long strands of DNA. And if you want to play kind of a, a strange evil scientist, you can monkey around with the DNA of a lot of different species. So D. melanogaster, these are different species of Drosophila. These are fruit flies. So we're going to see the term Drosophila a lot during the course. If you take the DNA, which is a double-stranded molecule, and again, we'll look at this in detail later, the separate strands of DNA will separate when you heat them up. And so if you then take heated up, separated, single-stranded DNA from one species and put it in a soup with that of other species, so this is another species of Drosophila, Similans, and a third species here, Funebris, okay? You can then allow them to cool back down and to see how well they cross-link and re-emerge. As we'll see, this is a complementary partner, and if these come back together, they'll be really tightly bonded because they have complementary base pairs. Again, we'll see this in a couple of lectures. This will be a really tight fit. But if they're not perfectly related, there'll be gaps where the DNA doesn't line up just so. So this, this will be a funny hybrid DNA, double-stranded, that only links together in a few places. And the more distantly related you are, the fewer the linkages. Okay? So then, if you heat that up, this hybrid will separate very easily at a relatively low temperature. This requires a higher temperature to get it to separate, and this requires a higher temperature at all. So you can actually use the temperature as an estimate of genetic relatedness. Now, more recently, people have been able to sequence the DNA in exact, exquisite detail. And as we're going to see, there's the language of DNA. It's Gattaca, named for the different base pairs that are in the strand of DNA. And you can actually go along a long sequence of DNA and find exactly which base is in there, which nucleotide is in each site along the DNA. And then you can compare two different species in exactly what base pairs they have in each link to the strand of DNA. Well, however way you do it, it's been possible now for about 40 years to compare and contrast similarities in DNA of different species. And here we now are going to have the pandas, and we have our outgroup. We saw before for the primates, our outgroup was a rabbit. Here we're using a dog to sort of anchor our tree. And it turns out that giant pandas their closest relatives are bears. 
panda bear is indeed a bear. Looks like a bear. It has a different diet, and in fact, its closest relatives are bears. For the lesser panda, it's not very closely related to giant pandas at all. In fact, it's not very closely related to anything, which is part of the reason it was hard to classify. But its closest relative turns out to be a raccoon, which, once you see that, kind of makes sense, because they both have striped tails in a similar shape in the head. So panda is not a useful taxonomic unit. So pandas are polyphyletic, and we don't really want to say panda is anything meaningful in terms of evolution. So when we do these classifications, what we want to try to do are to identify true homologies, things that evolved just once, like hair in mammals or feathers in birds. And we see that any two species will share those in common because of common descent. So our classification should be based on true homologies, and those are shared, derived traits. They happen once in their lineage, not in another lineage, and they all have them in common. And so some of the good traits that have been identified for making classification is in vertebrates here. Does the species have jaws? Yep, all these fishes, salamanders, crocodiles, they all have jaws. Okay, that evolved once. Do they have lungs? Yep, salamanders, everything down here, they have lungs. Do they have claws? Yep, lizards down here, they all have them. There's feathers only in birds, fur only in the mammals, mammary glands, that's what is truly the ultimate important trait in mammalian evolution, again, only in mammals, and then a four-chambered heart. Earlier species had three-chambered hearts. A four-chambered heart is only found in the crocodiles, pigeons, mice, chimpanzees, so mammals. So these are, again, showing us that crocodiles and pigeons are closely related because they have the same identified characteristics in their heart. So that is a shared derived trait, once again telling us crocodiles, pigeons are closely related to each other. Mice may look a lot different from chimpanzees, but they are mammals. They have a shared common ancestry because they have fur and they both have mammary glands. Now, I mentioned briefly about whales earlier on, and this is another area that was very difficult to determine their evolutionary history. Whales look really different from a lot of other mammals, okay? And a lot of people thought that whales were closely related to carnivores. So here's killer whales down here. They're truly carnivorous whales. There's a lot of other whales that are not carnivorous. And there were some fossils that looked like they probably uh, were carnivorous as too, but it wasn't, wasn't clearly determined. There were other people who said, well, mm, I don't know, a whale may look a lot like uh, you know, carnivore may eat meat with killer whales and stuff, but in fact, there are other things that tell us whales are actually more closely related to hippos, okay, and then ultimately to pigs than they are to carnivores. So the fossils that people had, usually they just had the skulls, they had a few bones uh, that would help them to say, yeah, they're probably carnivores based on these partial skeletons. But the DNA was really strongly saying, no, 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 whales are not closely related to carnivores. They're much more closely related to hippos, okay, ultimately to pigs, okay? So it wasn't until in the last 10 or 15 years that a really good fossil was finally found that showed in one of these early, early whales that their feet were hoofed rather than clawed. So they were descended from animals with hooves. Uh, like hippos or pigs, rather than claws like a carnivore. So we've seen various different approaches to classification. And traditionally, early on, people used phonetics. These were solely based on physical similarity. Sometimes they were good. They made good decisions about the, the classifications at a high classification level but they also made mistakes, okay? So phonetics is kind of passe, and we say, well, they did a nice job given the limited amount of information they had. But today, classifications are all phylogenetic, and as much as possible, they include information about evolutionary history. We want to know about the fossils in order to say what traits are recent and derived, which are shared, which are um, homologies, and which are analogies. So again, in doing this, this is trying to find branch points that the 
the cladists do in their cladistics to find branching points when there's divergence. And then evolutionary taxonomists are trying to estimate how long ago these events took place. So estimating the degree of divergence as well as just identifying where those branch points took place.